Hey there, it's time for another Ask Alyssa Anything session where I am answering all of your questions about the publishing industry and writing a stronger story. I love getting to sit down and see what's on your mind and what obstacles you're facing, so keep the questions coming and I will continue to do these as long as I can. If you're new to my channel or you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you go down and hit that subscribe button to join this amazing community of storytellers. And while you're at it, please hit that like button for the YouTube algorithm. And I also have a freebie in the description below, which is my story self-assessment worksheet. It is going to help you identify what is working really well in your current draft and what could be improved so that you can revise it with a fresh set of eyes and take it to the next level. It's also going to sign you up for my newsletter where I interview experts from the publishing industry and published authors, so you don't wanna miss out on all of that amazing advice. If you don't need the worksheet and just want to sign up for the newsletter, there's also a link in the description just for that. We have some excellent questions today, so let's dive right in. First question here, what are some literary agent and publisher contract pitfalls authors should watch out for? This is an excellent and very important question, and I'm going to answer it in two different parts because you did mention literary agents and publishers, and those are two different scenarios where you'd be entering a contract. So when it comes to a literary agent contract, you are basically signing an agreement that you are going to work with that literary agent and exclusively with that literary agent for them to submit your manuscript to publishing houses. The standard in the publishing industry is for the literary agent to take a 15% commission based on any book deal that they get you. So they will take 15% of the advance that they secure for you with the book deal, as well as 15% of royalties that you earn down the line. If there is any other number besides 15%, then that is a huge red flag because that is not standard in the industry. Additionally, if the literary agent is asking for any money from you upfront, that is a huge red flag and you should run the other way. The only way the agent gets paid is if they make you a book deal. And in that case, they take the 15% commission. That is the only way they get paid. There is no other arrangement between you and the literary agent where you are giving them money for anything. There typically will be some kind of clause in a literary agent contract that says you're going to work exclusively with them and you can't query other literary agents at that agency or just in general within a certain amount of time after you end your partnership. So I would look at the fine print on that and ask them any questions if you are concerned about potentially ending your partnership and what happens in that case. It is really good to know what that would look like if either they leave the industry or you determine the partnership is not working out. You should know what you are agreeing to when you sign that contract. As for publisher contracts, if you are going through a literary agent and they are getting you a book deal from one of the big five publishing houses or a traditional publisher who isn't big five but is still very well established, they are really going to help you navigate the nuances of your contract. So I wouldn't be too concerned with looking out for specific red flags because these contracts are pretty boilerplate as they are. Of course, there are plenty of things for the literary agent to help you negotiate, but they will help you work through that. There's never gonna be a situation where a literary agent is putting a scammy deal in front of you because they are only working with highly reputable publishing houses. Now, if you are in the position of reaching out to publishers independently, either because they accept unsolicited manuscripts, meaning you don't have to have a literary agent to submit to them, or you are thinking about doing a type of hybrid publishing deal, then it becomes very, very important for you to review the contract and I would say, even ask someone with legal expertise for help. That's because some of these quote unquote publishing houses are really masking as vanity presses or scam publishers where they're actually making you pay them and they're making you give up your rights to the book. So you really need to be very, very thorough in looking into what rights you are signing away when you are negotiating directly with a publisher. Again, in that case, I really would advise you to get some legal help. If you have anyone at all in your network who has expertise in that, that will be extremely helpful for you because this is your creative work and you should protect it. Here's another question that I get a lot, but it's worth repeating again. Wondering if there is a season for submissions like fall is the best time to submit to agents and publishers. Is spring the best time to submit or is it just year round? So 
There are what we call sleepy seasons in publishing. The holiday period is obviously one of them, and then the summertime is also a sleepy period for publishing where publishers and literary agents are just doing fewer deals because people are out of office, taking vacation, things like that. Does that mean you can't submit to agents during that time? Absolutely not. There are plenty of agents who are open to queries year round. Other agents, I do think more and more agents are doing this nowadays where they close to submissions for certain periods of time. So they likely are not gonna accept queries over the holidays or maybe over the summer, or maybe they will accept over the summer because they have a bit more free time to go through queries. Look at your agent list and see if there are any trends in terms of when they are open or closed to submissions and really base your querying plans around that first and foremost. Now, if you have a list of literary agents and all of them are open to queries and it's December and you want to get your queries out there, should you wait if it's ready to go? You don't necessarily need to. I would just keep in mind that it's probably going to take literary agents even longer than it's already going to take to get through to your submission because it is during one of those slow periods. But remember that a literary agent is not necessarily checking their queries every day. They're really dipping into the inbox whenever they have the time to do so. So it's not like they're going to see that you submitted to them on a holiday and then they're going to be turned off by that. They're just going to get to your submission whenever they do, which might be in a week, it might be in a month, it might be in two months or more. Just be aware that your query might sit there a bit longer if you do submit during one of the slow periods. Here's an interesting question. When I started writing my novel, I used flashbacks every few chapters to flesh out the main character's backstory. But now I am thinking instead of just having flashbacks, I should instead make the story a dual narrative with one story taking place in the present day and one taking place in the past. Any advice on when I should know to switch from changing the story to a dual narrative? I love this question because as a structural or developmental book editor, I am constantly thinking about the best way to deliver the narrative, whether it is this one character's POV, whether it's dual timeline, whether it's multiple POV, whether it's multiple POV, multiple timeline. I'm always thinking about these questions when I'm reviewing a manuscript, so this is a really interesting one for me to tackle. Of course, the answer is it depends, and it is impossible for me to evaluate really what the most effective version of the story is without reading it, but there are a few things to consider here. Number one is the actual content of the flashbacks. Is there an entire storyline in those flashbacks? or are you really using them to deliver character information about the protagonist? If there is an entire narrative in the past, such as the character going through a relationship or the character solving a mystery of some kind, then typically that would lend itself pretty well to a dual timeline narrative where we have an entire plot line going on in the present and an entire plot line going on in the past. So the first question is, is there enough there to actually make up an entire plot line in the flashbacks? If the answer is no, then perhaps the flashbacks are just that, flashbacks. They're little diversions within the main narrative that give us extra color and extra context on the character. In that case though, I want you to be really critical with how lengthy your flashbacks are because you don't want to divert the reader's attention for too long from the main narrative or else it is going to feel scattered and we're going to become disoriented and we are going to lose the sense of plot momentum that you have established because you keep taking us into these lengthy flashbacks. So think through the content of the flashbacks and how long they really need to be to answer your question. If you are going to go the route of a dual timeline narrative, it is pretty important that both feel really substantial and that we follow both plot lines from beginning to end. You don't necessarily have to split the book into 50% present narrative, 50% past narrative, but it needs to be somewhere around there. A novel that is 90% present narrative and then every so often we get this random flashback passage is not as likely to be effective. So you need to really think about the balance between the main narrative and the flashbacks and if they both deserve to be elevated as equal storylines. That's all we had time for today. Thank you so much to everyone who submitted a question. If you're watching and you have a question you'd like to ask, drop it in the comments here. This is the cue I use when I go through and answer them and I'd love to hear what's on your mind. If you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit that thumbs up button, and don't forget your free worksheet in the description below as well as the link to my newsletter. Thank you so much for watching and happy writing.